uh, my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of uh, Unique London to the second AI Science Cafe. My name is Chemisal Pawa, I'm director of the Czech Center and the co-president of UNIC London. So just in case you were wondering, UNIC is an association of European culture institute and embassies in the UK, with the main aim to promote European culture and foster a mutual collaboration with UK partners. Recently, UNIC and its member have also expanded their programs into science and innovation addressing topics of advanced technology, in particular, the artificial intelligence. So this is the rationale behind launching the annual series of Unique AI Science Cafe. So as the first Science Cafe explore the ethical dimension of AI and its many philosophical aspects, to the latest theme, we will focus on interaction between AI and art and its impact on creativity. In general, artistic and creative activities have been for a long time believed to be out of the realm and influence of AI, and with the AI's very limited positive contribution to the creative process. However, as we all know, there are AI algorithms, or if you want computer neural networks that can compose, for example, classical music indistinguishable from Mozart or Beethoven, can also write poetry or a theater play, such as when a robot writes a play that was premiered just earlier this year in Prague. I might add receiving number of reviews among others in Guardian and BBC, though I will not leave, uh, I will not read it to them, uh, find it to yourself and make a call on your own. But nevertheless, it brings a number of questions such as, Will the AI further enrich artistic creative process? Can there be a genuine and original output? Shall the AI be considered as a threat to the creative industries? These and other questions will be addressed and explored this evening. I'm very pleased that we will do so with such a representative international panel of speakers from various professional backgrounds, AI practitioners, artists, university expert from the United Kingdom, Belgium, Germany, and the Czech Republic. So with that, I am very pleased to introduce to you the chair of the panel, distinguished Melanie Lenz, who is the curator of digital art at the Victoria and Albert Museum. She's also a lecturer at the Royal College of Arts and a juror among others for the Lumen Prize for Arts and Technology. Before I turn the floor to Melanie, I would like to thank and acknowledge a great support organizing the Science Cafe to Wallonian Brussels representation, mainly to Simona Palma, and also to the Goethe Institute and the Czech Center. I wish you all to have enjoyable and engaging discussion. And with that, uh, I'd like to turn the floor to Melanie. So Melanie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pram. And welcome everybody. So I'm delighted to chair this session on art and AI. Um, the use of AI in the art has existed for decades um, and artists have explored AI as a tool and a topic to support, enhance, stimulate and replicate creativity by modifying data sets and changing parameters of machine learning to generate aesthetic outcomes. One example of a prominent early art pioneer in this field was Harold Cohen. Um, whose collection I work with at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Uh, for in the 60s, uh, Cohen developed Aeron, a complex software program for computer generated art. But AI has developed considerably uh, since then, particularly since 2018, uh, with the development of generative adversarial networks, or GANs as they're known, and machine learning algorithms used to generate images and audio. So whilst AI has existed in some form in the arts for many years, it feels like we're at a real pivotal moment where society is experiencing its ubiquity and pervasiveness. So as Prem mentioned uh, in the first talk in this series, the, the ethical implications of the use of AI were discussed, a topic that often leads, leans towards dystopia with questions rightly raised about consent, accountability, transparency and data bias. This discussion will specifically ask questions about how art, um, sorry, I should say, ask questions and answer some questions about how art can creatively and critically engage with AI, 
both now and in the future. So I'd like to um, encourage the audience, and it's great to see so many of you here, that if you have any questions, please do drop them in the chat um, and we will address those at the end of the talk. Um, I'm delighted um, and really honoured to introduce all three speakers tonight. Um, the first of which is Marie de Gestel. Um, she's a curator of Kick Festival, an international celebration of creative cultures based in Belgium, uh, where she's developed Afrikik, a project to showcase digital creativity of Africa and its diaspora. And she's also involved with the creative hub Fab Lab track. She's a member of the Digital Arts Commission of the Wallonia Brussels Federation. Um, and in 2020, she was elected Francophone Woman of the Year. So, uh, Marie, I'd like to hand over to you for your first presentation, please. Good, thank you. <laughs> the message has passed. So, good evening, everybody. Um, I am Marie. Uh, I am right now uh, located in Namur, uh, Belgium. Uh, and as uh, it's time of the after work, uh, I encourage everyone to share a Belgian beer or another beer with me. Uh, so, cheers to that. Um, so I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen um, because I prepared a presentation. Um, okay, I think the screen uh, should be on right now. Uh, if it's not, tell me. Otherwise, I will just jump into the presentation. So uh, my name is Marie and I am uh, the curator of a nonprofit association based in the south part uh, of Belgium, in the French speaking part of Belgium as well, as you can hear with my accent. Uh, and the association is called KIC and uh, we organize multiple activities. Uh, we are running um, a yearly festival called KIC Festival, uh, exploring digital and creative cultures. Uh, we are also running um, the Creative Hub and Fab Lab of Namur. Uh, we are, have an artistic production and distribution platform and uh, the last of our project uh, is called Le Pavillon. Uh, it's a new museum that we opened at the top of the Citadel of Namur and I recently curated an exhibition uh, in this uh, brand new museum called Humans Machines. And so um, this is the topic of my uh, talk today. I'm gonna try to um, uh, to yeah to state the importance of uh, replacing or placing humans uh, at the heart of uh, the development of artificial intelligence, and then I'm gonna draw some connections between art, humans, um, artificial intelligence, and creativity. Uh, and so, um, first of all, I would like to take uh, some uh, artworks as examples to explain you a bit how artificial intelligence works and how artists are using it. Uh, and also to stress the fact that uh, you will see that um, to answer right away the question that, uh, because quite often people are asking themselves, okay, uh, is, is AI replacing artists or human? And to stress the fact that artists are much necessary in the development uh, of AI uh, and also in art using AI. So the image you are seeing here um, uh, are 10,000 pictures of tulips. So here is a close up uh, of those tulips. And those pictures are real pictures of tulips that uh, have been taken by uh, UK based artist, Anna Riedler. Uh, and she took those 10,000 different pictures of tulips um, basically to field an algorithm that is uh, constantly inventing uh, new species of tulips. So this is an AI algorithm that invents those new species of tulips. And uh, this algorithm is dependent on uh, the, the fluctuation and the evolution of the course of uh, the Bitcoin, so the famous cryptocurrency. And doing this project, she was drawing um, a, a kind of a connection between the first uh, speculative phenomenon in the world called uh, the tulip mania um, that was in the 17th century that took place uh, in Holland, uh, which was a big speculation around uh, the price of tulips. And uh, she's, of course, referring to what's happening right now with cryptocurrency. And what is interesting with this project is that as you see, the video is quite beautiful um, and also very aesthetic. And this is because um, in the database that she used to feed the algorithm, 
she um, carefully um, uh, took exactly the frame, the same framing for each of the pictures, also with the same lighting and the same background uh, on each of the tulip uh, picture. And that's why uh, it creates uh, uh, such an aesthetic um, uh, video, meaning that if she had uh, been on Google image and had downloaded 10,000 images of tulips and tried to, uh, to create such a video, it would uh, look nothing like uh, the, the same results uh, because the database uh, was not carefully selected. And this is exactly the same thing in this project. Uh, so this is an AI algorithm that had been fed uh, with uh, 46 million images that were tagged uh, with the hashtag nature. But afterward, the artist Refik Anadol uh, used a lot of, uh, added a lot of textures and polished graphic and work a lot on the algorithm to have such a cinematographic and cinematic experience uh, in this artwork. Um, uh, here it's another example of um, an AI project uh, that was uh, developed in the Autodesk Generative Design Lab. So basically um, it's a, a group of designers that uh, builds an AI uh, algorithm and uh, the, the objective of, of the algorithm was to basically design a chair and they gave some constraints to the algorithm uh, saying, okay, uh, it has to be a certain seat height. It has to um, handle a certain weight capacity. And uh, we would like the final result to be in the Danish modern style. And the algorithm created a lot of models, but it needed the designer's approval uh, to finally arrive on this final result. Meaning that if it had been another designer who took the same task of designing a chair, um, maybe the end result would have been totally different, uh, even though uh, the constraints uh, were the same and the style um, had been the same. And uh, following this first experiment with Autodesk, uh, then Philippe Stark, the famous uh, French designer, started collaborating um, with these two uh, designers who started this experiment of a chair. Uh, except that they fed uh, the algorithm with a database of previous chairs and furniture design that were made by Philip Stark and, um, and the same constraints of, of what a chair is were given to, uh, to the, the AI algorithm uh, and they worked in a, in a process of uh, iterations until getting this final result and you can clearly see in those designs that uh, you can clearly really, uh, recognize Philip Stark's touch uh, in the design. Um, this is a, a, a totally a totally opposite project. Uh, it's a design. It's a, an artist, Philip Schmidt, uh, who decided to work on the concept of AI with uh, humor and irony. Um, and so uh, he did the opposite. He didn't give the algorithm any constraints of what a chair is. is and it, he just fed the algorithm with multiple designs of chairs and let the algorithm create uh, and interpret what a chair was. And uh, those are the design of um, uh, what, what the algorithm invented. And then he created in real, uh, he designed uh, in wood uh, the, um, the outputs that were invented by the AI algorithm. Um, there are also uh, applications uh, in, in more diverse um, uh, domains of, uh, of art and creativity. Uh, and AI has also been used uh, in uh, architecture. As you can see in this project, it was um, a project by uh, Zaha Hadid Architects. Uh, and basically they designed uh, this hotel in Macao as a vertical extrusion of the existing abandoned foundation of the construction site of a tower that never saw the light of day. So the construction was stopped and there were only the foundations remaining. And so they used the help of an algorithm to try to create, uh, to adapt uh, the, a new building to the foundations and uh, the structures that were um, in the floor. Um, AI is also used creatively um, with the uh, audio and music and sound creation. Um, this is one of the first uh, projects uh, that was done as an experiment in AI and audio. 
uh, it, Sony CSL Lab um, worked with uh, several uh, scientists and artists to feed an algorithm uh, with the entire discography of the Beatles. And basically, uh, the algorithm created a new songs, uh, a new track of the Beatles that doesn't exist. But uh, they had to train the algorithm until they got to this result that were, was quite similar to the sound of the Beatles. Um, it is also used, um, AI is also used um, to replace uh, the actual faces and even the voices of, um, of, of people in videos. So this is an example of what is called a deep fake. Um, basically, uh, there is uh, a video of a, of a rapper who is singing the song of the prince, the French prince of Bel Air, and uh, they are using AI to um, to, to basically um, put the face of, of someone else, like in this case, uh, Donald Trump, and to replace the voice of the singer by the voice of Donald Trump. Um, and this is a technology that uh, you will see more and more in a lot of uh, applications on, on your phone and in, uh, uh, yeah, in a lot of uh, other use on the internet. And uh, it's a technology that asks questions uh, because, of course, in a society where fake news are everywhere, um, you can, uh, with, with this new technology, you can totally manipulate videos and, and make other people believe uh, a lot of other stuff. I see that I'm already at 10 minutes, so I'm going to skip a few slides. Um, but basically, uh, as it was uh, also uh, a topic tackled in the other um, AI cafe, I will not dive into the, the question of ethics, but this is a question uh, that is asked by many artists who are using AI um, in their work and they are also collaborating with a lot of scientists to, um, to um, explore uh, the effects and, and the uh, ethical um, uh, issues related relating to the development of AI. And I would just like to finish with uh, one project uh, by Joel, uh, Joy Buolamini, who is an artist who collaborates a lot with the uh, MIT in the US. Uh, and she created this project, um, uh, which is basically um, um, uh, showing how uh, the big, big uh, AI algorithm of tech giants like uh, IBM uh, or Google um, have a lot of ethical pro pro ah, a lot of ethical problems. So this is a face recognition algorithm uh, that is supposed to recognize uh, basically the gender of a person, uh, the facial um, emotions as well. And a lot of those big companies' algorithms are mistaking uh, women of color for men uh, because uh, they are fed by uh, a, a majority of images that are not from Afro-Americans or people of color, but mostly white people. And it creates um, uh, those problems with AI that have trouble recognizing or categorizing dark-skinned people. And I would like to finish with this other project uh, of uh, Anna Garzalao, um, who is uh, basically um, uh, doing this artistic project to um, uh, show how Facebook and Google are basically using AI to categorize our pictures and to do data mining to feed basically um, their targeting and their targeting advertising. So they are using our pictures and what they can see on the pictures we post on social networks uh, to basically uh, have some insights about uh, our way of life, the kind of products uh, we like to um, after that target some specific advertising to that. So we see that there is still a lot of work to be done with AI and that artists are also um, sometimes showing uh, the downsides uh, of those technology, like this project uh, basically um, uh, showing how a facial, uh, facial recognition algorithm is not so efficient because on the left, uh, those people on the left are taken as cats, uh, are recognized as cats by the algorithm and on the right, uh, those are faces of cats that are taken as humans by the algorithm. So thank you for listening. Um, and, uh, and yeah, let's speak later uh, in the panel. That's 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Marie. Um, I would now like to uh, introduce our second speaker, um, Jana Horova. Um, she is Head of um, Theory of Interactive Media, MA and Digital Culture Creative Industries PhD Study Programme at the Maastricht University in Czech Republic. She's conducted research into robots and robotic art history and theory, whilst testing information technologically driven methods of research into new media art. So over to you, Dana. Thank you very much. I will share my screen with you. Okay, I think that now you can see. Uh, in my presentation, I would like to introduce you to our uh, curatorial project, Black Box, in which we use artificial intelligence as an unhuman or alien figure of a creator of post-apocalyptic exhibition. The Black Box project started in March 2020 on the initiative of curators of Tourist and Information Center Gallery in Brno. Its aim was to support artists during the first wave of the pandemic in their artistic research of the lockdown and the COVID-19 disease pandemic experience. The curators agreed to cooperate with our team, which has been testing potential of AI as a tool for the analysis of media art archive for three years already. And the cooperation began in April 2020. We decided to apply two different curatorial strategies to the same set of artistic projects so the visitors of the black box website, the exhibition, can switch between them and compare them. First uh, was the only artist will survive. It's the result of the work of the curatorial team of the gallery TIC. And the second one, the new archivist, is the outcome of our experimenting with the AI as a non-human curator. In my presentation, I focus on the new archivist project exclusively. If we want to tell something about AI projects, we must describe not only the AI tool, the software, but the data set as well, because the data set is a kind of textbook the AI learns from about the subject we want the software, the AI, to become an expert in. Let me start with a short description of the data set then. On the slide, there is a list of artists whose artistic projects are exhibited on the Black Box website. They include paintings, collages, nail art, sound art, or documentary of an activist project based on production of nanofiber face masks, etc. In response to the first call from the gallery's curators, the artists sent carefully selected sets of documentary photographs of their projects. But for our project involving AI, we needed a much larger number of images to be able to prepare a data set on which AI software could learn something about the COVID-19 pandemic. Therefore, we asked the artists to send us more visual materials, actually as much as they were able or willing to. The data set was enlarged with documentary photographs of the artistic research project, as well as with documentary records of their daily lives during the lockdown period secret parties, gardening and family time, covers of books they read, screenshots of their conversations on social media, popular online memes, etc. At the end, we got 1000 items into our data set, which is quite a small number, but it was enough to start working on our experiment with AI Curator. We framed the experiment with the narrative referring to the post-apocalyptic imagination. Imagine that the AI does not know anything about humans and it just found a box full of traces of human existence, pictures, drawings, photographs, sounds and texts. The situation might remind us of linguists who met a nation speaking an unknown language or of an alien visiting Earth someday in the future when humans are gone. To elaborate on the post-apocalyptic narrative, we chose a method called unsupervised learning. It's an area of machine learning usually used for searching for unspecified patterns in a data set that does not have predefined metadata with minimal programmer assistance. We carried out a total of three attempts before reaching the final version of the project. First of them, we called the power of color retrospectively. 
we used an already pre-trained exception network model, which is part of free, uh, free available Keras module for Python. It was software pre-trained on the ImageNet dataset, which is one of the largest databases of manually annotated image material of more than 14 million images. The color representations of the images, which are given by channels RGB, red, green, blue, were chosen as the main criterion for sorting the content of the dataset. The color parameters proved to be unsuitable for our purposes, actually. Artists often send similar colored images because they were shot in the same or similar environments or subsequently modified with the same filters. We find out that the AI can achieve high accuracy in sorting the data set according to the authors based on minimal input information. However, we wanted the AI created to look for common motifs across artistic projects. The second experiment was called Common Science. Regarding the, regarding the results of the first experiment, we converted the color of the images to a grayscale, thus the images were represented by only one channel where the values of individual pixels indicated the degree of gray. The main goal was to program the software to automatically, automatically sort the data set into unspecified categories. In this case, we still work with neural networks pre-trained on a freely available data set of images, ImageNet, collected mainly from photo sharing sites like Flickr, Flickr.com, etc., which weakened the AI software's functionality as non-human entity. In fact, we can say that the software served as a tool to look for relationships between coronavirus pandemic images and images collected on photo sharing sites. As a result, the AI creator often confused selfie images with an, and without face mask as the arrangements remain the same, like selfie in the car, selfie in the bathroom, etc. And therefore became a criterion with more weight than the face mask, a symbol of guarantee. The experience of the pandemic in this context seemed like a banal episode with the, within the ocean of the contemporary visual culture overproduction. In the third experiment, we try to be more consistent in fulfilling the original intention to use AI as a non-human curator. Therefore, a neural network was used which was not pre-trained on any external data set. A network structure called an author encoder was used, which consists of two blocks, an encoder and decoder. The first block has the task of reducing the original image input to a simplified representation the second block is used for retrospective reconstruction close to the original image. The result was the classification of the image data set exclusively consisting of the COVID-19 inspired artworks and documents into the unspecified number of thematic clusters. As the data set might expand and transform in the future, a neural network will also evolve, which may cause, for, ex for example, changes in the number of clusters, these thematic groups, or of recognized objects. The result of this experiment are hard to be evaluated. Our colleagues, engineers, said that because of the small data set, the outcomes did not achieve comparable results with the previous two experiments, for example. However, the art historians, as me and others among us, are satisfied because we managed to get as close as possible to what we imagine under the concept of non-human or alien curator. To conclude, while artificial neural networks are usually used to validate pre-formulated theories of art history, epochs, and styles, the goal of our project was to bring to life the inhuman essence of the AI system, if there is anything as an essence, and to provoke it to unforeseen behavior. In other words, to push the creature of AI to its limits to reveal its character. It's likely that we used AI inappropriately in our experiment and maybe we broke it if it's possible. However, the question is whether the experiment led only to the entropy of the AI system, the structure of the software, or if this kind of learning about AI by playing with it, which is another word, uh, in a, in another word for its using inappropriately, 
has any potential to become a subversive strategy of infiltration into the AI hive discourse. So thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to the discussion after the presentation. Thank you, Anna. That was a really fascinating um, presentation. Um, so, and on to our third speaker. Um, uh, it's a delight to introduce Mario Klingman. He's a distinguished artist who uses algorithms and AI to create and investigate systems. Um, he's interested in human perception of art and creativity and methods in which machines can augment and emulate these processes. His research spans generative art, cybernetic aesthetics, information theory, feedback loops, pattern recognition, neural networks, and storytelling. So over to you, Mario. Thank you very much, Melanie. Yeah, well, uh, thank you very much for having me today. And uh, in the next 10 minutes, I will share a little bit about kind of my work and my kind of the, the basic building blocks from which I'm kind of creating my art. So yeah, or what we call now AI art. Um, I see myself kind of in the tradition uh, that started uh, back in the 1940, at the end of the 1940s, in particular with uh, Claude Shannon's information theory and uh, Norbert Wiener's cybernetics. But uh, in particular, I'm kind of always fascinated by the works of Abraham Moles and Helma Frank, who kind of wrote pretty much the whole theory about how AI art would work. Um, all the ideas that we are now talking about have already been kind of laid out at that time. The only problem was that uh, there was one thing missing and that is uh, what, what happened in, uh, well, to around 2012 when deep learning kind of made its big entrance into the world. Because deep learning, like the, the training of deep neural networks, uh, allowed us now to, to measure previously an immeasurable topics, things, anything. So it allows us to, well, put categories to images, to locate uh, concepts in latent spaces. And to measure things, yes, in particular, first about images that, well, before we couldn't really put numbers to it. And uh, so it started with image class classification, these models. And uh, one of my early projects that I made during my residency at Google Arts and Culture is called X Degrees of Separation, in which I had this gigantic database of uh, cultural artifacts, which I, well, all classified with one of the, well, with the same neural network that Google uses for image search. And then I built a gigantic, well, space and can then ask between, to find uh, the shortest pathway between any two artifacts. And that pathway, the distance is always based on the similarity between these, well, these images. And we can see that there are very interesting kind of gradients almost happening. And we can also see that a machine in its own gaze looks at uh, pictures in a different way than us, but at the same time, there's also commonalities. And uh, so I built this installation, which then allows you to just explore randomly or systematically look for objects and uh, try to, yeah, and then find the intermediate objects. And that's what I find one of the first interesting aspects that often when we have, we are faced with a huge amount of data, our attention is usually focused on the shiny and well, and the loud, you could say, or the stuff that already interests us. And by using an AI to kind of find us the like map the space in between the things that we already know, we can start discovering things that we might have previously overlooked because they might not have been in the right context. Um, similarity is one of those big, like amazing things that uh, AI does allow us to measure. And here's a project uh, which has not been released yet. We call it uh, archive speed dating. Uh, I do that together with uh, Thomas Sauvin from, from uh, Beijing Silvermine. He has this huge collection of uh, over a million 
well, ephemeral photos uh, recycled from trash and has built this gigantic archive where of mostly, well, it's from China. And uh, now what we are doing is we are matching images from his archive with photos from other similar archives. So on the left side, you see one from a Romanian archive, uh, imaginary, imaginary archive. And so what I find fascinating here is that the machine can actually now, well, because this is a model, a rather recent model, it can recognize really concepts in images. So the matching is not purely on colors or forms, but it really knows that there are two people sitting on a table or, uh, well, there are two different dogs playing with different sized balls, but it, it kind of, if we had done this with earlier image models that didn't use deep learning, it would never have put these images together. So. This, I like working with ephemeral data and data that is kind of discarded as non-interesting and try to find kind of the interesting or clusters or other things that at normal times I might overlook. Um, of course, it doesn't stop with images. Machines can now, because like coming back from information theory, for me, all art, pretty much everything is information and it can be encoded. So we can also encode text, of course, and music we heard also. And what the machine can do, it can map, make us maps of relationships between concepts and uh, locate them in spaces and put concepts that well, semantically, in our understanding, are close to each other, the machine can also understand that these concepts are closer related to, well, than other concepts. And again, this possibility to start to measure things allows us also to navigate. Um, and when we can, we can throw this together now. So on one side, on the left side, you see a face generated with a style GAN. On the right, you see a quote generated by a text generation model that I trained on, well, on typical epigrams. And what happened here is that kind of the quote was evolved using a similarity model that understands text and image. And yeah, so I, I looked it up and it looks like this quote has never been, well, it has never been seen on Google at least. So, and I like this, that it getting, it's getting closer and closer to what I think is our understanding of the world. And so it, it's always fascinating to see this intelligent or this other type of entity, how it kind of figures out the world. And uh, well, the most important element with all these Deep, deep neural networks are the so-called latent spaces. And that is kind of when you train a neural network, it creates kind of an abstract mapping of that information in a hyperdimensional space. And same thing like you saw before on those uh, word mappings, you can always imagine that uh, this space is continuous and uh, well, and the fascinating thing is, yes, it kind of, is represents the understanding of the machine, like of the data that you trained it on. And well, my, I'm coming from the point that I believe that we actually never create, but what when we create, what we do is we are discovering kind of things that in theory already exist in that space of possibilities. So of everything that's possible. And what AI does is it kind of cuts out a slice of that space, which is kind of a space of probability. So um, in, the, in the space of possibilities, there is way too much noise and irrelevant information. And what the AI does when we train it, it extracts kind of the relevant information and kind of condenses that space. So when we start traversing it, we get to see more relevant information and don't have to look so much at noise. So one of my early experiments uh, from 2017, I call it the imposture series, in which I actually trained a neural network on pornography. And uh, what it does, it actually transforms stick figures, random stick figures into something that we might now see as the typical GAN aesthetic because uh, the images like the, the textures that we see and these kind of Francis Bacon-ish uh, 
distortions of faces are, of course, the direct result of the machine not fully understanding what, 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 we try, what I try to train it, but gets me into that interesting in-between space. And, and so this is the Butcher's Son, which uh, won me the Lumen Prize and is also in the permanent collection of the VNA now. So, of course, that made me very happy. But what I find quite interesting is that the AI allowed me to transform what we might call trash or junk into something that I find quite interesting to look at, or that is definitely different and might not even reveal its original source. Um, another experiment, or not experiment, actually an art installation is called, by, by me is uh, Memories of Passers By, in which I explore the, well, the question if a machine can continuously keep on creating visuals that stay interesting. So in this cabinet, there is actually a, a computer with an AI that, well, until it breaks, which I hope will not happen, will continue to create these portraits in which, which is based on some models that I trained on, well, Western European art historical, historical portraits. So of course it cannot escape the probability space of, uh, of portraits, but, it will still create interesting mistakes and misinterpretations, which again, in my eyes, allows to the machine to stay interesting because, well, as long as we cannot fully predict what will happen next, things keep uh, staying interesting for us. That's kind of how I, is my interpretation of information theory or one part of it. And yes, and one more. So this is uh, kind of the same model, but slightly differently used. And uh, yeah, but the, the longer I have been working with uh, AI now, the more I realize that in the end, comma, uh, <laughs> in the end, the, those machines that we train, all we can train them on is on our own data, the data that our civilization has produced over the past centuries or millennia. And whilst it still allows us to kind of, well, look in the in-between spaces or extrapolate a little bit outside, in the end, what we will still find there is mostly we will learn more about ourselves. And uh, which is great, but so in the end, the machines will never kind of fully take over because they still need that, uh, like us as almost like a conduit to, to, to find the meaning in what it offers us. Uh, here is a installation called Uncanny Mirror in which, uh, well, there's a camera that films people and uh, so it acts as a mirror, but what actually happens is that the face or what you see is kind of based on everybody else who looked into this mirror before, but uh, at the same time, kind of using this misunder, like the misinterpretations of the model that uh, sometimes mistakes kind of the information that it gets fed and uh, produces again, some interesting grotesque uh, visuals. And lastly, this is uh, appropriate response is also an AI based work in which uh, a machine that I trained on uh, epigrams and famous quotes is creating a well for everybody who kneels down in front of that display, it will create a unique quote which might sound uh, quite interesting and wise and uh, will very likely be something that has never been said before. And in that case, it's, I find it also quite interesting because it would not work without the human in the loop because the human becomes actually the, that part which makes sense out of uh, what it sees on that screen. And uh, well, so it's, it's a, yeah, it's, it, well, that, exactly. <laughs> That's what I mean. And uh, it is also very interesting to see how if you create something like this, uh, almost like a ritual that I'm doing here with the kneeling and then the atmosphere, that the moment people see this, they take what they see on the screen very personal because they know this is only created by their interaction with the machine. And well, that's, uh, that's it for me. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, Mario. That was really fascinating. And indeed, all three presentations, it was great to hear um, three very different perspectives um, thinking about art and AI. So I'm now going to lead a um, conversation, discussion um, between the three speakers. And then once we've had that, I'll be opening it up to the audience. So if the audience want to start thinking about their questions, do feel free to continue to put them in the chat. But to, to kick off our conversations with Marie, Mario and Jana, um, I'd like to pose a question, actually the same question to all three speakers to start off with. And that is, um, has AI pushed the boundaries of creativity? And if so, I'm interested in the implications of this. Arguably humans have always used tools to extend their creative capabilities. But if AI has transformed this, does the use of AI by creative practitioners disrupt, disrupt traditional models and relationships, e.g. between artists, museums, collectors, curators and audiences? So you've each touched on this, obviously, each of your presentations, but I just wondered if you'd like to just uh, say a little bit more about how um, yeah, these different relationships have been disrupted, if indeed you feel that is the case. Um, Marie, do you want to kickstart this? Your thoughts on that as a curator? Uh, yes. Um, I, I don't think it, it, it really disrupts uh, an entire sector. It's, it's more than, you know, uh, I think artists are working with the, the tools that are available right now. And as AI uh, has been, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, super developed for the past 10 years, uh, they are just taking the technological tools they have um, uh, at their disposal uh, to experiment and create new forms of art. And also, I think, um, especially in the in the sector of uh, art and science or art and technology, um, artists are using those tools to also question the implications of those technologies on, on society. And I think the example of what Mario is doing is is uh, exactly um, uh, explaining that. It's showing that basically uh, uh, he's like. Um, uh, exploring what we have been creating uh, for many, many years, exploring the data and, and trying to create some new connections, asking questions also about uh, the, the times we live in uh, right now. Uh, so I think it, it doesn't really disrupt things. Um, it, it's more like I, I see, uh, you know, those technologies and especially AI as like, uh, you know, the um, uh, new tools, like the painter uh, had, uh, you know, tools uh, or the drawer had tools to paint. And now we're just, you know, uh, going a bit further in that. Would you agree, Maria? Is it a tool or a collaborator for you? Or how, what, do you, how, what are your well, thoughts? Well, uh, yes, I definitely agree that uh, it, it's, it's in a tool like any other tool. Um, it's a very time-saving tool, I would say, because uh, I believe, yes, that AI artists are not really doing much different than traditional artists have done. The problem is that traditional artists that work with physical tools are kind of limited by the process, the time it takes to explore possibilities. Uh, like if I do a painting, it well, it's simply like I, I can only do so many paintings at a time. Whereas if I train a machine, on exploring a certain area, then, uh, well, I can look at uh, a thousand or 10,000 variations in a day and very much quicker kind of, I know it when I see it. Because I, I believe really that, uh, as I said in my talk, that in the end, uh, we cannot, our imagination is, is limited by what we already know. In, and so what we have seen, kind of all the experiences we've taken in and we transform them and, uh, in order to create something new, we have to kind of, well, get new input in to create new output. And AI allows us to kind of very selectively on one side or also kind of half randomly kind of stretch out in that space and, and get more, more feed for our brain to then create meaningful output. So yes, and uh, so, and I think it's important in this time where information kind of is racing at a faster and faster pace. So every kind of all these social channels, people want more and want to see, want to get more input. And so AI allows us to kind of overload and produce that input. It's not necessarily good, but it's just like these times that we're in that uh, 
we we can't wait anymore. So and AI serves one of these purposes. Uh, Jana, I'd like to hear your thoughts on anything that's yeah. also been raised. Uh, maybe I would uh, just uh, comment on the uh, ability of AI to broaden our cre creativity. I put on paper just three marks that I think that this AI art is something, uh, the new art form, uh, which is one of these typical postmodern artistic strategies of uh, remake, remix, post-production, appropriation. So there is like high-tech, like remake uh, strategies. And I find it very interesting on the level of uh, new methodology and, and the method of creating of art, I think it's really new and um, for me interesting. And I found, for example, Mario's work excellent in the uh, working with the big data sets and the uh, topic of, uh, or the concept of the interface to this data he gave us because they are really beautiful. They have the beauty of the old image of old paintings. And I really appreciate the aesthetic quality. And I think that the, the visualiza visualization of data is uh, like, it's said that it's like new avant-garde. The avant-garde of 20s was interesting, that new vision, this distorted angles of photographs and uh, new, rep new ways how to represent work, but the avant-garde of the end of the 20th century uh, is interested in the visualization of data. And we were, uh, when we were talking about the art institutions, I think that it's really, it is a big um, issue for uh, like art archive, archives of uh, media art. It, it, it's one big uh, topic to discuss how to collect this kind of artworks. Uh, maybe also uh, the question of the one unique original artifact, which got that super uh, prizes usually, if you take the art as a market uh, place. And uh, yeah, the originality, the uniqueness of the artwork and uh, the question of archiving this artwork is something that is really challenging for us. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, my next question was to Mario, uh, although you have asked part of this already, which is when you previously said your worst nightmare of AI is that ultimately it's limited by human imagination and whether you still feel that's the case. But I feel like you've actually already elaborated to that point. So I'm actually going to ask you quite a simple question. Well, on the surface, simple. And that is, what is AI good at? What is good at? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> um, well, I think what it's good at is at, um, at this finding of inter, well, of things that are in between and slightly outside. So it's good at kind of mapping, well, mapping things that uh, initially had only fixed categories, which is what we humans like to do, right? Like that's kind of also what we are so shocked about when the AI does that. But in reality, AI does not have categories. It has this continuous space. And I like kind of that I can move in all kinds of directions, whether it's on a stylistic level, on a semantic level, in between media. And so for me, that's kind of what AI breaks up. It's kind of, it actually breaks up these separations into boxes, into saying this is so in in a model fine art lives next to each next to kind of trash and noise and uh, and just banal stuff but uh, for the ai it does not make a difference it's us who have to navigate this space and have to make the decision then like what we how we want to see it and i i like that that it's it does not really give me the answers it just offers me kind of offers me something that I still have to decide well if I want to see that at the truth or if I want to continue moving from there so yeah that's and that's I guess what it's good at like it allows like I think it by working with the AI I start thinking a bit like the AI so Five years ago, I did not think in latent spaces and hyperdimensional spaces, and 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 now I look at the world this way. And uh, for me, that makes sense. So if I see social interactions and uh, or art, then I 
myself put these things like I see these as feature vectors in a space that interact and and for me that explains a lot of things in the world so this will take a while maybe until most people will think like that but I think it, there's hope in it because uh, some it demystifies certain things and I, I like that I mean there might be new mysteries but um, yeah <laughs> Fantastic. And I guess the reverse of that is uh, to you, this my next question, Marie, that we've just heard about some of the beneficial aspects of AI technology. But your presentation um, or, like touched on the ethical considerations in, in terms of Joyce's work with MIT. So is AI a threat and how do we navigate the risks of its parasitic bias inherent in data sets um, as AI systems, as we know, are ultimately designed by humans? I know it's a very hard question to answer, but I just thought, like your thoughts on that. How, yeah, how do we navigate this? Uh, yes, uh, I think it is uh, a, a threat, uh, but is it up to us to not not to make it a threat? <laughs> and that's uh, the the complicated part because uh, I was a bit, uh, you know, stressing on the on this point in my presentation, but I didn't have more time to explain um, uh, everything about it. But basically, you know the data that we use uh, to, um, uh, you know, for an AI system, uh, whatever the purpose of this system is data that is categorized by humans. And so depending on the way we categorize this data, uh, it will um, have different outputs and different results. And humans are humans. We are not perfect. We are not machines and uh, we'll never be, you know, perfect and we'll never be able to do automation and so we come with our flows and with uh, our, uh, you know, de defaults and with, you know, a, a, a lot of uh, also misconceptions uh, about the world. And so basically, just to take an example, if um, you decide to, uh, you know, train an AI system uh, to um, give some, uh, uh, you know, small amounts uh, of loan uh, uh, for a banking system, let's say, and that you train uh, this, uh, this AI system on previous data and previous statistics uh, of uh, when um, a loan was, uh, was uh, enabled and agreed uh, to buy, let's say, a television like 1,000 euros or uh, when it was not a given. If you take all the data um, uh, and the, the previous statistics and that the previous employees who were doing that task were um, uh, doing some discriminations uh, because, for example, uh, they would think that uh, maybe people living in certain areas uh, uh, would come uh, from a, a lowest uh, social uh, uh, level and have a lower income or just sometimes based on the name of the person, they would not agree to give the loan. Then this AI system would exactly reproduce the same biases that uh, are in, in the data uh, in the beginning. And so um, it's up to us and to humans and not to machines to uh, uh, have this in mind and to, to pay a lot of attention about those ethical questions because um, the more AI is gonna come into our lives, uh, the more it's gonna become problematic because we are all making mistakes and uh, we are all uh, sometimes misjudging uh, things in the world. And if those misjudgments are coming into AI systems and uh, which are connected to uh, a lot more data and are becoming more and more complex. It's not that, okay, there, we cannot say, okay, there is an error in the code. We will just fix this line and that's it. You know, it's going to work again well um, because it's connected to already so, um, so many data streams and infrastructures that um, we need to think it before uh, building it because once you build a system, or you need to adapt it, but it takes time. So um, yeah, I think uh, it's a threat, but it's up to us not to make it a threat. Thank you, Thank you for that. Okay, um, my last question uh, to Jana, which uh, before I open up to the public and uh, Maria and Marie, you might also have thoughts on this, but um, Jana, this is more of a provocation or my last reflection, um, and that's concerning how and where we place value on AI artwork. Um, I would put forward that we need to re-examine our notion of creativity. Um, mimesis is an old aesthetic concept, but it often is often leveled as a criticism um, at AI artwork. 
However, whether AI art has lasting aesthetic value does require, I would argue, um, work that's not purely mimetic, but goes beyond, e.g. hand curation of data sets. Um, and I just wondered if you wanted to respond to that um, about how you think we need to embrace the critical potential of AI. Um, critical potential of AI art. Yeah. 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 I think that uh, that's something that I think that it's really important. If we, if we count uh, AI art as a part of uh, like current new media art, it should be more media sensitive and more context sensitive, I think. And, as I think that um, uh, AI tools to automatically search uh, within the visual or uh, data or uh, text on a social media were developed for surveillance or the control over the social networks. And then I think that it's really important to have it on our minds when we are dealing with the AI tools uh, creatively because already to use this AI as a artistic tool can be subversive strategy to withdraw it from the uh, means of control and make it make art with that uh, tool of control. But there is many other strategies that, that we can use maybe to, to, uh, to maybe uh, spread some education about the dangers of the sharing our personal data. So I think it's really important to think about it in that more uh, like conceptual, uh, 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 like on the conceptual level of the, of the art. So maybe that aesthetic, aesthetic uh, aspect of the uh, AI art is not so important, but I think that's because I think there is like decrease of the evaluation of the beauty. Uh, I have to say, I appreciate art that is complex, that is beautiful, it's critical, it's uh, like expression, uh, like authentic, it's um, uh, virtuosos, it's, it's like means uh, or artwork of the virtuosos who, who is able to really uh, manage the tool perfectly, not as us just playing with it. <laughs> so I think it's a very complex question. There will be many different genres of AI art, I believe. <laughs> uh, Mario and Marie, do you want to say anything about um, how if we need to re-examine our notion of creativity? Or if not, I shall open up to the uh, like public questions. We've got a lot of questions. So up to you if you want to say anything. You're happy for me to um, just jump straight in. So we have Thank you everybody for submitting questions via the chat. Um, I'm just going to go to the top. So some of these questions I feel like have actually um, been answered already. So um, one question was, does some AI um, degrade arts expression? But I think uh, through various examples that um, everyone has shown that that isn't necessarily the case. It's on a case by case basis. Um, there is a fantastic question asking, and maybe Mary, you'd like to answer this one. Can you give advice to artists who would like to learn to work with AI? Is there any special equipment needed? Well, uh, actually not anymore. So there are some good resources to get started. Uh, well, the, the one that I always recommend first is called, uh, is by Gene Kogan, Machine Learning for Artists. It's ml4a.com, in which he has a lot of tutorials. And the great thing is, yes, whilst you need kind of powerful GPUs, these things are now available for free in your browser. There is, for example, Google Colab, which is kind of where the code is running on some server, which you don't run yourself. So, and it's free. So that's a good start. Uh, there's also um, an uh, application called Runway, which uh, this costs, but it also allows you to explore and play around uh, or actually use a lot of these pre-trained models, uh, or you can even train your own models and you do not really need programming skills. So, so and then of course there are some simple tools which just allow you to play around with uh, latent spaces, which I'm not too fond of that's uh, but it also it's an it's a nice way to explore typical gan models uh, well it's called art breeder for example where well you can just click on images 
I mean, I always think, of course, that's more for just getting a feel for this. But uh, if you actually want to create museum art or gallery art with AI, that's probably not enough anymore just to make pretty pictures. So I think, I mean, to answer your previous question, we have kind of left that stage where it's only about pretty pictures and you have to actually use the tool like you would use a camera or a typewriter to tell a compelling story or just say something. It's not about the AI, but it's what you do with it. So, and well, and of course, new people coming in, coming from different angles, it's great because the early ones like me were maybe too much focused on the programming aspect and the, the shock and awe. And now I think we we already reaching a new phase where, well, yeah, maybe new voices are needed. People with different questions, different approaches. Great, thank you. Um, we had a question, maybe Marie, you'd like to answer this one. And that's, does AI art place too much importance on human history through its data sets? Is AI art, is AI art just rehashed? I mean, obviously Mario's touched on that, but uh, yeah, if you want to add anything to that question? Um, no, I think it, basically uh, uh, to, to feed an AI system, we need some data. And so, and of course data is coming from history or it's coming from now. You could feed it from uh, also um, uh, data, uh, you know, that is emerging right now, but uh, in some way it touches to our world, our, our construction of the world and history of the world. So of course, um, you know, that's why uh, it's, it's been used so much. And also that's why those topics are, are so mu much uh, questions uh, within those artworks. But as Mario was saying, I think um, we have done a lot of that. I mean, we uh, artists, uh, uh, creators, and, uh, and I think uh, there, there are some new types of questions that will be asked in the future. Um, and it will also depend on how fast AI is evolving, uh, how uh, you know, fast also computers uh, uh, are. And, um, and basically, if, if, if the evolution goes super quickly, then new types of questions will be ask, asked because it will create new types of problems as well. Um, so I think we are just, you know, at the very, very beginning of it. Um, and in the future, it will yeah, evolve a lot, but I, I cannot tell you uh, how or where. Uh, and I think it's the new generation also of artists, uh, you know, uh, who will uh, start to explore those topics that uh, will, you know, lead it to uh, some, uh, you know, uncharted territories. Uh, yeah, that's interesting that actually uh, answers or kind of answers off another question that's asked which is could it be possible that we start categorizing art as AI assisted and non-AI art um I don't maybe I don't, <laughs> like possibly I'm not I sure don't, anyone can <laughs> I don't really think so because then uh, uh you have to categorize bio artists and then you have to categorize any type of artist who who is using uh, a new technology or new tools or whatever you know uh, if artists, uh, uh, you know, starts to uh, make art with cars, you know, moving cars, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> we will not categorize them cars artists or, or whatever, you know, it's, uh, they take what is out there, uh, AI is out there, they use it. That's, that's it, I think. Okay, um, so uh, there's a question here, maybe Jan, you'd like to answer this. Um, so they're saying thank you for the conversation, perhaps um, many of the models that are being used, such as um, GANs or Transformers like BERT, are produced by companies like Google and Facebook as part of their research into extraction and the production of values uh, for their um, monetary purposes. Are there ways that you see a corporate or capitalist perspective in the lenses that uh, through the tools that are being used to make uh, art, applied art? Do you see the use, like the original uh, companies that have maybe developed these uh, tools coming through in the artworks or not necessarily? Uh, I don't know if I get the question. Is it that there are some already tools that can be uh, used? That there are, for example, Google offers to everybody or and there are some other tools that probably someone must uh, program himself or herself, if I understood it right. I think that maybe that problem of the 
um, softwares for creativity in general, that they uh, usually you produce that standardized outcomes that finally you have to develop your own style to uh, at least hack the software and somehow adapt it to your own needs, how you want to express through the AI. So uh, I don't believe very much for, uh, for, uh, for this uh, standard commercial softwares for so-called cre creativity. It's, uh, it's good maybe for people to uh, show them that, that they can be creative to using computers, not only passive audience, but uh, it's not uh, for artists, I think. They should uh, learn to uh, program to understand how the uh, computer works. And yeah, I think that their knowledge must be much deeper. Okay, Marie, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, it's it's just to say that uh, I think that of course, if you you're using a system that is developed by a, a big company, um, uh, in a way, uh, and even in the data that you're getting from that company, it will be influenced, and and the output will be influenced by that. So, for example, just with a simple example, you know, if you if you type, uh, you know, a blonde girl or or cutie blonde girl or whatever, you know, on Google search engines. Um, you will have the same type of images that will that will come out, you know, uh, and and those images will be um, uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, like it, they will all look like uh, you know uh, super cutie Barbie girls. Uh, the type of images that you would see, for for example, in a, a pornographic website, in a way, uh, uh, because that's uh, influenced by uh, you know this this marketing uh, uh, system as well, and also by all the searches that people are making on those search engines. And so, in a way, all the systems are influenced by the way we uh, use it, use them, and also by the way we design them. Uh, and that's um, you know uh, uh, what I was saying uh, in the chat regarding this topic of ethics. Um, if you don't have a diverse group of people who are building those technologies, of course, um, the technologies will only reflect one side of, of, of the story or one side of the picture, if, if, if I can speak uh, uh, like that, uh, meaning that if it's only uh, uh, white males in the Silicon Valley who are designing uh, those technologies, of course, they will kind of uh, um, uh, avoid, not, not even, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, on purpose, but they will avoid uh, certain groups of people or they will not uh, maybe include a certain way of viewing the world in, in the way they design their technologies. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a question specifically from Mario here. You've actually answered part of this already by talking about the specific programs that you've used. But the second part of this question um, in relation to hyper-dimensional spaces, do you think AI can show faster and access to the understanding of the world for humans, um, like yes. through open states of consciousness <laughs> and in relation to the spiritual world, realm. Oh, okay. Um, yes, or, I, or anyhow you interpret uh, that uh, I, I think, especially now with the latest models that are coming out, uh, there's more and more overlap in how the machines understand things uh, and uh, like how the machine interprets information and how we, so I mean, recognize seeing the results that i'm getting i can recognize some form of intelligence in there so in a sense that i th i think we are getting to the point where that model that we build of how a brain works while it's not identical to ours it will give us more and more of the same results but in a controllable fashion so and yes and that will eventually lead us to understanding consciousness and when it comes to spirituality, well, I guess that is kind of also kind of part of our brains and maybe on a deeper layer, like again, using kind of that similes uh, saying that our brain is also structured in a certain hierarchical fashion where there are deeper layers that we don't have words for, where which are just kind of bubbling up. And so spirituality for, in my opinion, lives on one of those deeper layers, which then kind of, bubbles up to your, well, verbal understanding or to your actions. And so, yes, I believe that uh, we will get some better understanding how, how we function or, and predict things, of course. I mean, and that, if, 
again, as I said, like maybe it demystifies certain things and we, some people don't want to hear that, but uh, I guess we are getting closer and closer to mapping this entity that it will react in, in ways that we would in a human to react like to certain stimuli, to inputs. So reading a book, looking at a picture, the machine will kind of react in a way that we would uh, like say like, oh, a human would do that too. And so in, in any situations, not only looking at a dog, but also looking at a, a movie and kind of simulating emotional responses or spiritual responses. So yes, I think we will get learn more and more about ourselves and, and the way we, these things that we couldn't have measured before. And now they become simulatable and measurable. Yeah. Fantastic. So we've got time. There's just one last question, which um, after which we'll have to wrap up. Um, but that is, I'm actually going to roll two questions into one. Um, somebody has asked, is AI more efficient at creating art? And then the second part is what comes next? What follows AI art? Does anyone want to tackle that one? Should I? I don't know. I, or, yeah. I, okay. Yes, efficient. I mean, uh, I mean, efficiency and, and art creation is, of course, something you don't want to put together. But it's kind of again, like, what is efficient? It means that you you get to a result that you are happy with, that you feel, well, I don't know, tells a good story, tells the right story, and using AI, you will get to that result probably quicker. Like, at least based on my theory, that that's how our creativity works. So. Um, the question is if that's really better, but yes, if, if you me just measure efficiency by work put in to results getting out, I think, or time spent to get a certain result, yes, then AI will definitely also make you avoid things that have already been said and you didn't know about that. I mean, that's usually the biggest problem <laughs> that, that we keep on reinventing things and, and forgetting things and then rediscovering them. And so, of course, an AI that knows everything that humans have done before can kind of steer your creativity to, I don't know, skip over things that have already been covered and point you to spaces that might still be worth looking deeper into. So by, by this measuring process and classification process, of course, always in collaboration with what you want, like where you want to go. But it, yeah, it can give you more of a aerial view of the, of the map. Whereas if you are just working on your own, you kind of have always just your own perspective of the, or your impression of the field, of the surrounding area where you're currently working in. Yeah. Okay, that's wonderful. And unless Marie and Jana want to add anything, we've or kind of, um, oh, yep, Jana? Yeah, I would just add something that I think that Mario just in the end of his um, uh, speech just said, but I, I was thinking about what AI art is more sufficient for than some other arts. And I really think that these visualizations of data is something special, something unique. And that we, uh, for, if we want to, represent our uh, topics we deal with as a generation or as a humankind nowadays, they are global and they are uh, over our like, like single person perspective. So I think that visualizations of the global problems of ecology, of, uh, I don't know, pollution and th uh, things like that, and to transform them into the artworks that can help us to think about it, to stop and to look at it and uh, maybe to change our behavior would help very much. Maybe it's not time for portraits on landscape, but for data visualization now. And I think that pandemic show us that it's really global. Uh, now, all, the, all everything we are facing is, we should uh, face it together, I hope to say and translate the programs to be able to understand it individually on the same time. That's very true. Um, so I think now it just really, um, I just want to say thank you so much, um, Marie, Mario, Jana. It's been really interesting, fascinating and insightful presentations from very different perspectives, but with lots of common ground. So yes, thank you once again, it's been a delight.
So over to you, Pam. I know you'd like to say a few words. Oh, uh, great. Uh, thank you, Melanie. Uh, I think as Maria said, uh, we are at the beginning of the AI era, but unfortunately at the end of this fascinating and interesting uh, discussion. So I really would like to thank cordially to our speakers, uh, Marie Stel, Jana Horakova, and Mario Lindemann, and of course the, the chair of this evening panel, uh, Melanie Lenz. Also thank you to all of you for, for joining us this evening. Uh, also like to invite you for the next uh, AI Science Cafe, which will take place in early June on, on 8th, with a topic on smart mobility. Please stay tuned. And I'd like to wish you have a nice evening. And if you have not grabbed the beer or drink, please do so. <laughs> and thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you.